The Wealth of Some Nations, Section Imperialist Reformism and the Labor Aristocracy As ought to be uncontroversial, in the final quarter of the 19th century, involvement in trade unions was greater in those establishments where skilled manual workers were better paid. Thus, in Germany, Wilhelm Liebknecht, co-founder of the Social Democratic Party with August Bebel in 1869, frankly stated at the Party Congress of 1892, beginning of long quote, You who sit here are also, most of you, aristocrats, to a certain extent, among the workers. I mean insofar as incomes are concerned. The laboring population in the mining regions of Saxony and the weavers in Silesia would regard such earnings as yours as the income of a veritable Croesus. End quote. Britain's trade unions, too, largely represented the labor aristocracy and successfully pursued a reformist course. Beginning of long quote. The mid-Victorian period of trade unionism was essentially that of the definitive national organization of the pompous trades and proud mechanics, the skilled minority of the working class. Defense, not defiance, became the union motto to defend the vested interests of the craftsmen, not to defy the employing class with the organized might of the whole working class. Similarly, the line, a fair day's wage for a fair day's work, implied the full acceptance of the existing order, subject to specific and limited reform, to getting the best that could be got within its framework. End quote from Hutt. The ability of Britain's rulers to maintain divisions within what were then typically, and quite properly, referred to as the working classes, was due to the industrial hegemony Britain had achieved by means of colonialism. Beginning of long quote. The triumph of free trade meant complete freedom for capital. There was an industrial and commercial expansion on an unparalleled scale, leaping and bounding, in Gladstonian phrase, returning profits not of tens but thousands percent, confirming Britain the workshop of the world in its privileged position of industrial monopoly. Thus it was both possible and necessary for substantial concessions to be made to the two main groups upon whom this prosperity depended, the textile factory workers, who were greatly benefited by the Ten-Hour Act of 1847, and the skilled artisans in the metalworking and building trades. The consolidation in this way of an aristocracy of labor, over and above the main mass of the working class, was fully reflected in the new reformist and defensist character of trade unionism. End quote from Huff. The growth of new unionism in the final decade of the 19th century and beyond broadened the trade union movement. Yet it did so without thereby undoing the stratification of labor, and, crucially, without challenging the imperialist social contract. Even the wave of syndicalist unrest in the period leading up to the First World War did not reverse the social chauvinist mentality of most British workers. Rather, throughout the Victorian era, we see precisely the kind of social imperialism avant la lettre, of which the Western left would find itself approving as value transfer has increased. Beginning of long quote. The domestic radical program, like the Fabian program of a few years later, rested on the assumption that home and foreign affairs had in practice very little connection. At home, the task of the radicals was to promote a more even distribution of wealth but the wealth that was to be redistributed was taken for granted, without any examination of its sources. It was regarded, in effect, as natural and assured that Great Britain, as the leader of world industrialism, should go on getting richer and richer, and should devote her surplus capital resources to the exploitation of the less developed regions of the world, drawing therefrom an increasing tribute 
which radical legislation would proceed to redistribute by means of taxation more equitably between the rich and poor in Great Britain. End quote from Cole and Postgate. The ranks of the labor aristocracy were broadened in the second half of the 19th century with the rapid expansion of the capital goods sector and its high demand for skilled workers. New labor aristocrats in the metal trades joining older ones in building and printing in the capitals of England and Scotland. The political moderation of the mid-Victorian labor movement, especially its trade union component, was due largely to the increased dominance of these skilled males therein, those, quote, moderate and responsible men who, whilst laying strong claims to the rights of male citizenship, wish to achieve a stake in society. Kirk argues that historian Eric Hobsbawm is correct to draw a close connection between the distinct, if modest, improvement in all but the environmental conditions of the working class in the third quarter of the 19th century, and increased political moderation. The evidence points to a clear rise in the living standards of a significant section of the British working class from around 1860, and an increasing differential between many skilled and lesser skilled, and unskilled male workers during that period. The rise in British wages was intrinsically connected to growing imperialism, as Hobsbawm has written, beginning of long quote. The further we progress into the imperialist era, the more difficult does it become to put one's finger on groups of workers which did not, in one way or another, draw some advantage from Britain's position, who were not able to live rather better than they would have done in a country whose bourgeoisie possessed fewer accumulated claims to profit and dividends abroad or power to dictate the terms of trade with backward areas. Or, since there is no simple correlation between the standard of living and political moderation, on workers who could not be made to feel that their interests depended on the continuation of imperialism. It is indeed true that the benefits of imperialism and its promises were unevenly distributed among various workers at any given time, and that some of the mechanisms for distributing them did not come into full operation until the interwar years. It is equally true that the growing crisis of the British economy complicated the pattern. But, on the whole, the change remains. To sum up, the roots of British reformism no doubt lie in the history of a century of economic world supremacy and the creation of a labor aristocracy, or even more generally, of an entire working class which drew advantages from it. End of long quote. With some important qualifications and corrections, it is valid to posit an overall link between economic improvement and reformism during the third quarter of the century. Thus, for instance, English cotton operatives were generally much better off in material terms in 1875 than they had been in 1850, with the post-1864 years being a period of substantial, in many cases spectacular, rises in money and real incomes. Given this overall improvement, Kirk argues, quote, It is surely not coincidental that reformism took increasingly deep root in the cotton towns. End quote. Certainly, many labor leaders consciously attributed their newfound moderation to the material and institutional gains of the years after 1850. That there had been real improvements in the standard of living of the working class was explicitly vouched for in the analysis of working class reformers and their allies at the time. Footnote. See, for example, Ludlow and Jones, 1867. End footnote. Alongside structural changes in the capitalist mode of production, rising living standards brought about by falling prices, and the ability of trade union organizations to ensure that wages did not fall concurrently, Kirk accounts for working class conservatism by highlighting conflicts following a massive and unprecedented increase 
in the level of Irish Roman Catholic immigration into England's cotton districts. In the years after the catastrophic Irish famine of the late 1840s, this led to tensions between sections of the immigrant and host communities. Kirk establishes that a, quote, working class fragmented, that is, stratified, along ethnic and wider cultural lines, greatly facilitated the reassertion of bourgeois control upon the working class, and helped to attach workers more firmly to the framework of bourgeois politics. Thus, ethnic conflict operated against the background of the apparent inevitability of capitalism, to restrict further the potential for class solidarity in Lancashire and Cheshire, and to provide sections of the bourgeoisie with the opportunity to assert their authority in a fairly direct way upon workers. End quote. The extension of the franchise to part of the male working class in Britain with the Reform Act of 1867, the Second Reform Act, was the means employed by the ruling class to forestall quote, an incipient alliance between the casual residuum and the respectable working class as fear grew on a national level of a possible coalition between reformers, trade unions, and the Irish. End quote. This analysis is borne out with the example of Britain's fiscal policy with respect to sugar duties. Beginning of long quote. Government strategy was driven by a number of different elements, not least the fiscal problems of the state. It was necessary to increase revenues by imposing income tax, beginning to shift the burden of taxation from indirect to direct taxes, and, at the same time, keeping income tax low through increasing revenues by lowering duties on consumption goods, and thus boosting, in particular, working-class consumption. This has to be seen in the broader context of, on the one hand, dealing with the Chartist insurgency, by attempting to attach the working class to the state through encouraging consumption and some measures of social reform, and, on the other, of dealing with the interests of manufacturing and the effects of the economic depression of 1837-42 to through attacking the corn law problem. The latter would also entail addressing the crisis in Ireland by moving towards free trade as the putative solution. Within the wider framework, British Conservative Chancellor of the Exchequer and Slave Plantation owner, Henry Goulburn, situated his aims so far as sugar was concerned. Sugar had become an essential element of working-class consumption, so his aim was, quote, to secure to the people of this country an ample supply of sugar. But he also wished to make that supply, quote, consistent with a continued resistance to the slave trade, and with the encouragement of the abolition of slavery. End quote. Finally, he sought quote, to reconcile both with a due consideration to the interests of those who have vested their property in our colonial possessions. End of long quote by Hall. However militant the labor aristocracy struggles against employers over the past century and these are frequently and routinely exaggerated and whitewashed by the left. They were never directed against the division between oppressor and oppressed nations, against the imperialist system that guarantees the amount of foreign loot to be divided amongst the warring metropolitan classes. End of section. <laughs>